Next time you take a leisurely stroll through a woodland in search of some peace and quiet, give this a thought. There's a whole host of creatures all around you. The birds and the bees are the obvious ones, but there's thousands up in the canopy and below ground, and we know very little about them. To better understand how these often tiny animals fit into the bigger picture, scientists from Irish universities are taking part in a Coford funded research project, exploring how these little wheels fit into the greater scheme of things. I met Dr. Tom Bulger from UCD in the Bracklune native oak woodland near Westport. This quilche managed woodland is one of the best studied and understood sites in the country. We're working here on uh, looking at the biodiversity or the numbers of species that occur in these woodlands. Constantly we come across species that haven't been recorded in Ireland before. When most people think of biodiversity in forests or anywhere else, indeed, it's things like birds, butterflies, plants they think of. But in fact, they're a tiny minority really of the species richness, if you like, of the system. The great majority of species work away quietly and like the servants of the past, many live in the basement and are essential for the system above to continue. There are armies of dustbin men working quietly away. So when we talk about functioning of a forest, the ecosystems, etc., what are, we, what are we talking about? What is it? Well, essentially in any ecosystem, there are going to be two primary functions. There's going to be the process of growth which of course we associate with the trees and so on. And springtime spring mostly. Springtime, exactly. And then there's the process of decay. And as we go through here today, you'll see, in fact, it's a good time of year to see this, these two processes of growth and decay more or less balance one another. Um, very little are eaten by herbivores. Most of it goes directly back into the soil. Tom, we're looking at a lot of the oak leaf litter here that's fallen this autumn. By springtime, most of this will have disappeared. Where does it go? Well, if you turn, turn over these, we will see things like wood lice and so on that feed, feed on, the, uh, on the dead leaves and grind it up. In fact, if we look in this piece of, uh, of dead timber here, we can see the, the product, if you like, of this activity. The animals eat the timber, pass it through their digestive systems and produce these droppings. So the, the leaf is ground up by the animal and then those ground up particles are fed on, if you like, by bacteria and fungi to produce the nutrients which will feed the tree. Tom, what sort of species will you find here? In a system like this, we would expect up to 200 species of things like insects, millipedes, wood lice, just to occur in a single square metre of soil. There are armies of dustbin men working away, tidying up the forest floor. These are the giants. Many more are just at the limits of our vision. But just how much more there are is revealed under the microscope. They are also at the bottom of the food chain, and without them, the larger animals would not be able to live there. Native woodlands can have a lot of plant and animal species because they've had thousands of years to develop. But a conifer forest can be just as intriguing. This is a mature Sitka spruce forest near Mount Rath. Towering giants in a sea of moss and ferns. Forests like this harbour some of the largest forms of life on Earth. Bigger than whales or anything else we know. What's so special about fungi? Well, the reason why I'm interested in them, Duncan, is they're an amazing life form. They're like an alien life form. Most people, when they think of uh, fungi, maybe they think of the edible mushroom. But fungi actually live as minute microscopic filaments. We're walking over them here. And how big can they grow? They can grow enormous. Uh, the record, in fact, for a single fungus uh, from North America is a fungus that covers 1,600 football pitches. Two and a half thousand acres. My this is God. an enormous fungus. Really? One fungus? One, one individual fungus covering this huge area. Now that's extreme. Uh, they can be the size of a dinner plate, or they could be the size maybe of a tennis court uh, or thereabouts. Most are found in forests. And the reason is that uh, they decompose the dead remains of 
trees, the leaves, the fallen timber, the roots and so on. We have more than 4,000 different types in Ireland and their fruiting bodies come in all shapes and colours. These are two decomposers, Duncan. Uh, they're living off this dead trunk that you see here. This tree has fallen and it's gradually been rotted away. This, this timber will completely decay. Caused by these? Uh, caused by these, yeah. They break down the cellulose in the timber and the whole thing will just eventually disintegrate. Back into um, recycled, back into soil? It's going to be recycled back into soil and more importantly, it's going to be recycled back into the minerals that the, the living trees need. You can think of a forest as a large recycling operation. So what would happen to a forest, Tom, if there's no decomposers? The system would literally grind to a halt because the decomposers are recycling. They're recycling the nutrients. Um, if there weren't any fungi, what would basically happen as, as dead leaves fall, as branches fall, they would accumulate. You'd have a thick layer of these in the forest floor, but you'd have no recycling of nutrients. So the living trees uh, would simply run out of nutrients. Understand. And we'd be up to our armpits and just dead, dead plant material <laughs> that wasn't going earth. anywhere. The ones you see here are not decomposers, they're in partnership with the roots of this tree here. These are the fruiting bodies, the fungus is on, actually on the roots of, of the tree. And are these all both helping each other? They are indeed, yeah. The, the, the fungus is actually uh, taking up phosphorus from the soil and donating it to the roots of the tree. And in return, the tree obviously has to give something to the fungus and what it does is it gives sugars that it makes from photosynthesis and it gives, in fact, up to 20% of the sugars that it makes. So it's quite a valuable association as far as the tree is concerned. But not all fungi are good guys. And here, Duncan, is an example of the third group of fungi. This one is a killer. Not only has it killed the tree, but it is actually now surviving on the dead remains as well, so it's decomposing the tree. They're a forester's nightmare. Foresters don't want to see these in a forest. Bad news in a forest. But they're few and far between. The great majority are beneficial, and without them, the woods as we know them would not exist. So these things are a lot more intriguing, a lot more widespread than I thought. So why do you enjoy shopping? I don't know, it's fun. I like spending money on shows. I like to buy new stuff and have new things and it's a very relaxing moment when I go to, to do shopping. So how much do you reckon you spend? It's hard Maybe to say. 30, 40, 30, 40 euros a week. You enjoy shopping? Oh, I love it, yeah. And what about yourself? I wouldn't have the same interest. I like going shopping in my spare time. So it's like a hobby for you? Yeah. Kind of. Yeah, I like shopping. Would you shop out of necessity uh, or do you shop because you actually want to just have fun? Uh, I think it's both. So would it mainly be sort of stuff you need that you buy or would you buy stuff um, for fun? Mainly what I need and the odd thing for fun if I'm going out. It's almost a childlike behaviour. People often say with children that the child demanded and demanded a particular toy or other item and once they got it, it just remained in a cupboard. And sometimes as adults we can be guilty of the same thing. There's simply a sense of I can have it, I want it and I can have it. Now some of that accumulation is, has nothing actually to do with the item. The item itself can be discarded pretty soon. The shopping becomes an end in itself rather than the item. There are theories that say that shopping for some people releases dopamine. Dopamine is something that gives us a little bit of pleasure through the brain, so that when people are shopping they actually get that buzz. But like a lot of other things, the, the pleasurable buzz disappears fairly quickly, and the only way you can regenerate is to go back and buy some more. That's why you sometimes hear of people being addicted to shopping or being referred to as shopping addicts. Shopping has become the number one recreational activity in Ireland, and the resulting consumer feeding frenzy has pushed her level of personal debt to around 33,000 euro per man, woman and child. But besides the challenge of personal borrowings, the massive increase in Irish consumption over the last decade has also had a huge effect on the environment. 
take this seemingly harmless ready meal, each ingredient of raw produce has to be transported to several processing plants. This involves air, sea or road transport. From the processing plant, the food has to travel onwards to be combined into the package that we buy in the supermarket. Then the finished meal is sent to perhaps three or four distribution centres before it reaches the supermarket shelf. And when we finally eat the meal, we're left with the packaging to get rid of. But it's not just food items that have increased our consumption level. We've also increased our water consumption, our electricity, our cooking, our space heating, our petrol, and a whole range of household appliances. Unlike their parents, children in Irish schools are now being educated on the impact that consumption has on the world around them. Those who attend the country's green schools are especially aware of those eco-criminals that waste the resources of the planet. Sometimes my sister goes out of the room, she leaves the thing, the light on, and I have to go, then I go upstairs and I see the light on, then I always have to turn it off every time. You're very good. You're doing a very special environmental programme this year with your mummy's and daddy's, and does anybody know the name of it? Yeah, it's green schools, but when we include your mammies and daddies, it's called Green Home. Excellent, it's called Green Home. Using green schools as a launching pad, the EPA and Antashka have piloted a Green Home initiative to encourage households to audit their consumption levels and work towards making their home a greener place. It's important that people aren't just aware of problems, but that they also take steps to doing something about it. So they fill in all these audits for us. So they've got their green home audit. So at least the, the householders now know where they're at. From that then, we take them forward and say, right, what are we going to do about this? So we provide about five nighttime meetings for parents to come along and attend. These meetings cover areas such as climate change, energy saving in the home, uh, renewable energy sources in the Greener Homes grants. We also have meetings on waste reduction and how you can slim your bin. We speak as well about water conservation and transport. But what makes a greener home? To find out, we assess the impact of the Green Home Project on two families in Drumiskin, County Louth. The heating is zoned. We have an upstairs zone and a downstairs zone. So when we want to have heating upstairs, which is probably just for an hour every night, when it's cold, uh, we can put it on for the hour. This here's our compost bin that we use to compost all our uncooked household waste. Um, I'd never been able to get it right or to get it to work properly until uh, we were part of the, the Green Home program down in our local school. On the flooring, we have um, insulation underneath all the floorboards. This here's our uh, effluent treatment system for the, for the household waste. The bacteria and everything collects on that there and breaks down. Now I have a little pet project that I'm going to try and eliminate this actual tank using electricity. I'm going to build a little, uh, small little wind turbine. This is a bit of an old bicycle. Actual turbine blades made from a little bit of plastic pipe. They'll all fit something like this. We get a lot of passive heat during the day and then we close the blinds at night to keep in the heat. We also have a grey rated cooker and our fridge freezer as well. You know, aluminium cans, glass, paper, cardboard. We also compost quite a lot, separate sections for paper, cardboard and plastics. It's our uh, Green Homes programme calendar. Um, each month it's got a series of different tips that can be used for, um, for being more energy efficient. This is our wood um, pellet boiler. It does our heating and it, it does our water. When we started off first, we thought it was working okay, but having been to the Green Homes meetings, we, the feedback um, from it, we felt that ours wasn't working properly. So we phoned Garcross and they kindly out, sent somebody out and it's working very, very well now. It's only small steps that we're doing and it's, it's going to be continuing over the years. Like, you know, it's sort of, so it's not just a, big bang, something changes, but it's just slowly evolving, you know. Unless more and more families change their consumption habits, Ireland, and indeed the whole planet, is in trouble. The Environmental Protection Agency has a simple message for those who want to help. 
I think the key message is to buy less. I think make a list, buy what you need, don't buy more than you need, try not to be fooled by fancy packaging, try not to be fooled by the glitzy shops and the myriad of choices we have. Like in the 1960s, your average grocery store had 2,000 product lines, modern supermarkets would have about 15,000. So we need to try and really be organized ourselves when we go out shopping to make sure that we're not bringing home excess food. We've got to bring that food home, we've got to transport it, we've got to refrigerate it, sometimes cook it or not, and then put it in the bin. And really, your bin is only the tip of the iceberg in terms of the amount of waste and the environmental impact of your waste. A mobile phone, for example, the real weight of it would be something like 75 kilos, the weight of a grown man, which isn't something that you'll carry around with you. But if you take into account the um, mining, extraction, processing, transport, packaging, all of that that goes into a mobile phone, it's a lot bigger than the one little mobile phone that you have to throw in your bin so that you can get the new fancy dancy upgraded model. Despite the subtle and not so subtle techniques of the marketeers, the individual consumers left with the ultimate responsibility for a massive mountain of waste. And at our present rate of consumption, it's hard to see how we can avoid rapidly bankrupting the natural resources of our planet. Water costs a lot for distribution and treatment, but we take our drinking water for granted and waste large amounts. So we need to look at ways to conserve it, as it's a precious resource. Here's a few easy tips. Take shorter showers, especially if it's a power shower, which uses over 125 litres in less than five minutes. Instead of letting the tap run, use a basin to rinse and clean your fruit and vegetables. You could also use the leftover water to give your pot plants a drink, or you could collect rainwater for use in the garden. The Great Shannon River was once the main artery of communication in Ireland. Now in the 21st century, it is mainly used by tourists, but it's under increasing environmental threat from pollution. The Shannon River, we look upon that as the spine of the whole region, running from uh, up in the north and Belik all the way down to, to, the, uh, to Limerick, the mouth of the harbour. Carrigan Shannon in County Leitrim is the boating capital of Ireland and the starting point of my journey down the Shannon. Oh, Duncan, you're very welcome Hi. to Carrigan Hi. Shannon. Thank How you. Are you? I'm travelling on a Waterways Ireland boat and I'm investigating the ecological threats facing our greatest river, the Shannon. Shannon has been a very important and integral part of not only the tourism industry but also of the local economy. The development here has particularly aimed at the tourist uh, clientele. A number of hotels have been built here in Carrick and in other areas such as Leitrim Village etc. A lot of holiday homes have been built uh, very close to the Shannon. A lot of angling takes place, a lot of uh, water sports such as water skiing, wakeboarding, uh, canoeing, uh, and a myriad of other activities. We sell Ireland overseas as being a clean, green environment. So 80% of visitors from overseas tell us that they come here for the environment and the scenery. So it's up to us to deliver on the expectation and on the story that we have told. So what about the natural habitats here for wildlife and ecosystems along the Shannon? Well, the Shannon is a treasure of wildlife and flora and fauna, from uh, deep reed beds, to the Shannon callows, to uh, a myriad of different uh, species of fish and animals thriving along the waterways and indeed in the waterways. I'm wondering, with both agriculture nitrates and phosphates filtering into the river and wastewater from the new developments, what the quality of water is like on the Shannon today. All activities have an impact on the waterways and it's how we manage those activities is critical and is key. These areas are being managed jointly between the councils, ourselves, Shannon Regional Fisheries Board and others uh, through the Water Framework Directive and through measures that are being taken to protect the integrity of the waterways. With so many boats and tourists on the water, Tourism must also cause a threat to Ireland's water quality. What are Waterways Ireland inspectorate doing about this? While we're out patrolling, we'd be looking for um, any pollution which we would need to report. We would now and then get um, a big film of oil on the water and you need to try and track it and, and report it and make sure it's contained within the area. Patrol boats are also in charge of enforcing the speed limit of five miles an hour. 
Besides the danger, noise and pollution, speeding boats create a wash which can upset the nesting wildlife in the river reeds. So how do tourists using this waterway reduce their environmental impact? Well, we in Waterways Ireland operate a policy of bring home your rubbish, basically, uh, number one. Number two, the second policy we operate is a total ban on the pumping out of uh, the holding tanks from boats. It's very important that all of the stakeholders involved, uh, industry and agriculture as well, all play their role in ensuring that we have a good quality clean water. Up until the 1950s, it was the canals and navigable rivers, not motorways, which were the main means of freight transport in Ireland. We turned off the Shannon to visit Jamestown, once a busy cargo stopping point, on one of the two canals which connect the Shannon with Dublin. With the decline of farming, I'm seeing evidence that tourism on the Shannon and the canals are playing a vital eco-tourist role in sustaining the rural Midland economy. Barges carrying cargo have been replaced with thousands of holiday cruisers on our inland waterways. Albert Lock deals with 11,000 boats in the height of the season. This is the busiest lock on the Shannon and is managed by Michael Burke. The purpose of the lock is to take you from one level to the other, either up or down, depending on the direction you're going. Right. Uh, people are dependent on you to tell them about the river. You are the face of the river. My father was lock keeper here before me for 48 years. Really? His father before him and his father before him, going back to 1890. What do you do with my boat now? Get your boat down here now and I look after you. I will pull in on the port side as I told you and I'll drop you. Thanks Michael. Okay. I set off again on the Shannon in the direction of Loch Ree, which is one of three large lakes on the river with over 100 islands. The Celtic Tiger had meant that many Irish people have also invested in boats and cruisers. Marinas like this one at Harvey's Point near Athlone on Loch Ree was a hive of activity when I arrived. So how do tourists help the local communities along the waterway? How do they contribute? In a recent study undertaken by Waterways Ireland, it's estimated that the spend of tourists outside of renting the boat is upwards of €1,000 per head per week. So it's a significant spend uh, in the local economies. The one thing I would say to tourists when they visit the Shannon or any of the other waterways of Ireland is that they should take a look around, see how unspoiled and beautiful those waterways are and let's keep them that way. Over a quarter of a million people are employed annually through tourism in Ireland. I've seen today how important the Shannon and lakes are to the local and Midland economy, but I'm also aware of their environmental threats to our waterways. See you again, Margaret. See you, John. Thanks. Thanks. Bye now, too. See you now. This is a precious resource, and if we want it to have a sustainable future, we need to ensure that the water quality, the ecosystems and the wildlife are properly protected and managed. Climate change is now happening. It's our greatest and most urgent environmental challenge. Our next episode is specially dedicated to the global effects of climate change, Ireland's situation and how we need to respond. <laughs>